On this episode of Ham Nation, we've got some great information for ham instructors. Plus, Bob shows us how you can build a simple phased array for your HF station. Don has news of the tornado that recently hit the Hara Arena. And Dale's got some great Dayton videos. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by DX Engineering. DX Engineering offers practically everything you need to outfit your shack, plus the fastest shipping in the industry. Most in-stock items ship the same day, Monday through Friday until 10 p.m. Eastern. For more information, visit dxengineering.com slash hamnation. And by ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash hamnation. And all of our Ham Nation viewers, be sure to check out the Twit survey. It'll only take you about six minutes. It wants to uh, interact with you and find out some of your software uses and et cetera. So please do that. I know you have coffee breaks all day long. Do that while you're having your coffee break. They greatly appreciate it and help out the Twit Network. And you can find that at twit.to slash survey 14. This is Ham Nation, episode number 404 for May 29th, 2019. Simple phased arrays you can do. Hello, everybody uh, from stormy Illinois. <laughs> this is Bob Heil, K9EID, and I want to tell you, this has been some kind of a season. We're going to get into a lot more, but uh, we've got Gordon West with us tonight. We have George Thomas with us, and we have... Mr. Newsline himself, Don Wilbanks. We're going to come back to them because each one of them has some really incredible stories, especially the big story of the week, I guess, is that Hera Arena is no longer there. And uh, you'll get to hear more about it. If you haven't heard, Don's got all the news. But before we uh, we get too carried away and my internet goes away, it's gone away twice in the last 15 minutes, I've had a lot of things about uh, emails and even letters from guys. They want to know more about the phased array that I put up. So here's the best way I can do it. Here's a little four-minute video of how to do this, and it's very simple. We have just completed the installation of a 75 meter phased array antenna system consisting of a pair of coaxial dipoles mounted atop a pair of 55 foot telephone poles. We put them in an inverted V fashion and the poles are 64 foot apart. These are 500 foot from the operating position fed with RG213. In order to make the antennas directive from east to west, we use a delay line a 43 foot here on 75 meters that's switched in and out of the driven element, either east or west. The down lead length is 126 foot. We take all of that coax, the down lead length, the 43 foot phasing delay line, and mounted them in a container, one of the plastic container boxes that we actually buried and just the top of it shows. It's all sealed, so it's waterproof. But that's the way we get to switch f all the components from 500 foot using one of the Amatron RCS 8V remote switches. It really works well. Take a listen to how we can get at least 10 to 20 dB difference east to west. Like a lot of people do, I mine's usually three inches or so. It, you know, that's just after I get done mowing it. And uh, I know, you know, probably, uh, uh, you know, we get a dry day. I'm I'm gonna have to lay out there and mow. That's just all there is to it. Because you know, if you leave it that high, when it starts growing any at all, it gets looking right. It gets looking ragged pretty quick. So. Uh, it's, uh, it's to that point now. and uh... The system really performs on weak signals. Take a listen as we switch to the direction they're coming from. Also note, the preamplifier makes no difference on 75 meters on this signal. 
the preamp will, of course, make the meter read higher. But in many cases, the preamplifier does not cause the weak signal to be more readable. Check it out. Here's some great sounding AM stations, and we were getting about 20 dB front to back. Well, when the leaves drop off, I'll start using it. <laughs> uh, Daryl, uh, Brixton Digital Audio Recorder, I need to do that too. That'd be nice to have. And I was going to mention to you too about your uh, pictures with the uh, Fifi. Um, I had sent that out to a few friends, and one of my cousins of Lizzie. Well, we were talking about your uh, you yesterday uh, with Brian. Uh, Brian, you know, the thought was that you could locate that remote receiver out at Brian's QTH. And, of course, by the way, if you have it out of Brian's QTH, you could use the Internet. And we're on the Channel Zero VUW. Well, I'm going to need to go up on the hill and uh, swing that log around to the west. Because you well, guys were off the back, apparently. Um, I thought, I, I just didn't think about uh, which direction anybody would be. Great performance from just a couple of pieces of wire. You can do this. It's very simple. You need just three things. Of course, you need the antennas, but you need the delay line. You need the remote switch. And, of course, then the down lead links. The uh, RCS-8V from Ameritron makes it so easy. But the delay lines are important. They have to be exactly 43 foot on 75, 22.6 on 40, and 11.4 feet on 20 meters. The down lead links, both of them have to be exactly the same length. And all that can be coiled up and put in that container box that you bury. Keep in mind, you can do this with regular wire dipoles. Just make sure they're exactly the same height and the spacing is correct. Have fun with this great technology of phased arrays. Well, as you can, uh, can see from the video, this thing really works. And uh, I would uh, entice you to, to do it. 40 meters is so simple. I would only have room. It's only, they're only 33 foot apart and 33 high. Amazing. So there you go. And uh, uh, all of this is on my QRZ page if you need all those. Uh, hey, send me an email or give me a phone call. And worst to worst, I'll go pick up Gordo and we'll come and put it on for uh, I'll put it up for you, okay? Uh -huh. <laughs> Gordo, I got an email today from a person from England that watches the the show and they called you the godfather of ham radio and boy are they right. So <laughs> I wanted you to know we all think a lot of you, buddy. So what do you got for us tonight? What's going on in Costa Mesa? Well, thanks, Bob. And I would be delighted, delighted. to go with you uh, and uh, start putting up some of those phased array. And you know what a great difference it is to hear the sounds between east and west by switching over. And, you know, that's what we're going to talk about right now. And that is the amateur radio service of upgrading or getting that first license. Yes, I'm happy to report uh, I finished with the general class book, and it was a hot seller at uh, Xenia. But, you know, the big thing is the ham radio classes, and we encourage so many of you to get signed up and become a amateur radio instructor. Now, whether you're using my book or alternate books, you'll find that we have free instructor training materials just for you. And the most popular set of the materials are my free instructor guides. And in the instructor guides, we take you through a timeline of either teaching a weekend ham radio class or if you're not really into instructing as an Elmer, we tell you how to support an Elmer with ham radio stuff that coincides with the um, weekend class. Or if you want to do a class once a week for eight or nine weeks, we give you all the details in our free instructor guide.
Well, first things first, and that is a ham radio brochure and in our instructor guides from the W5YI ham instructor program, we actually give you a sample of one that worked for me talking about my free training, only cost of materials and the test fee two-day class for technician. General really requires three days and the extra requires at least a couple of weekends, but the classes are great but only if we can get the students to open up that brand new general class book that's just been updated beginning July 1st question pool. And the way we do it is for you, we offer you about 30 pages of student homework where the students are encouraged to find out is coax flat or round. And we give them the page number to look up the correct answer. That way, when they hit the classroom, they've actually opened up the book and got all the way through the Q&As. Well, depending as to how large your class is, you can either have the students on each side of tables facing you that you see on the bottom right hand side, or you can do them horizontal. And I like the idea of a packed class. That always makes it a lot of fun for you and your fellow instructors. And when those students hit, we want them to see that we're ready for them. You wanna make sure the classroom is safe, that it is accessible by the handicap, that they can come in and easily a uh, wheelchair up to a desk space that you've made specifically for them, like you see on the left-hand side. But you want to have them with a positive feeling when they hit the classroom. And you got to have stuff. That is, you can talk about the reactance of a coil, but you can actually do demonstrations that we'll see there. So here we see the students on each side of the tables facing the instruction table. And uh, we packed a ton of people in there. They didn't think they would get uh, 40 or 50 to fit in a room that normally holds 25 with the tables the other way around. It's great to have your team of volunteer examiners <clears throat> And those volunteer examiners usually are right there as uh, Tina and Dave are to uh, greet the students and bring them into the classroom, make sure they get a good parking spot because you want them in a good mood when they're gonna take the class. And this is all covered in my free training materials. And again, if the tables are horizontal to the instruction area, then we do the tables and chairs and all the greeting material. But when the students come in, they go, wow, this is really nice, sort of a formal setup for what will be a fun weekend or a fun evening. Now, if you're doing a weekend class, you've got to bring everything and hopefully you'll be able to stay in the same classroom uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I say Friday evening, uh, getting them going all day Saturday. Saturday evening, we usually visit a ham's house and Sunday, getting them ready to uh, sit for the test because we want to do more than just teach them to pass the test, but rather to play play ham radio. And the only way you can do that is have the stuff. <clears throat> and each of the stuff is described in my extra class or my general class or my technician class study guides, instructor guides. And uh, that way you're never losing track of where you should be when you're teaching the class. Because we've rearranged all the questions in the three books that I do to better follow the flow of getting folks into ham radio fun, not hitting them right on the very first get-go with Ohm's Law. But believe me, we do cover electronics in detail. So have a lot of stuff, and you'll find that in between each class session, the students will come up during the breaks and take a look and start playing with the stuff. And of course, a CW oscillator. Uh, kids, especially when we do the uh, Boy Scout classes, and incidentally, on our technician class, we show you the cross between uh, teaching the Boy Scout class and the radio merit badge. So you uh, scout leaders uh, get the technician class instructor's guide. Again, it's absolutely free. Um, the little clothespin CW oscillator, uh, Dave Ingram was the one that gave me the idea, but that's always a favorite one, especially if the students put it together themselves. But no, they don't, they don't use their thumb in doing it. Well, be informed, I was informed, that's the way students do it. 
And that is they are so used to using their thumb and uh, forefingers for uh, tapping out on their uh, smartphones. <laughs> and I didn't think that they could send that fast. Let me tell you, kids with these little handheld CW devices could send lickety split, even though it's sort of unorthodox. By the way, for those of you interested in uh, related articles, a compendium, uh, it's about, let me just take a look at the page, 127 pages. Uh, go to W3 Delta Kilo Victor. That's uh, Peter Carone. And uh, Peter has pulled together every living article there is uh, and shows you exactly where to look it up. So if you're interested in CW, get a hold of me and I'll be happy to give you his contact information. But you know, nothing beats live action. And um, uh, here's Daniel uh, holding up uh, the um, Ohm's Law. We've got voltage, we have current, we have power, we have resistance, and we actually for extra calculate the resistance of the pickle. But you know, once it gets glowing with 110 volts uh, going through them, uh, it uh, changes resistance. We like to show solar panels. We like the kids to understand that one shatter will sometimes put you off the air on those panels that are in series. Uh, we like to do digital, and you know the new general book now has a section just on digital, and we describe that in our new general class instructor's guide that'll be available when the new pool comes out in July, although the book is now available. And for those teaching technician, I like to get the students excited that not only is there two meters and 440, everybody can do that, but there's Skywave excitement. Skywave's all the way to the International Space Station. We talk about that in our instructor guides from the W5YI group. And uh, we even show um, a, a PowerPoint. We have a complete PowerPoint set for each of the licensed classes for the instructors to use. But we encourage you, don't just do PowerPoint, but rather use PowerPoint to back up what you're reading in the instruction guide. And as Bob was showing you, we got audio as well. And that is an audio CD for each level tech general and extra that um, is available uh, with each of the books as well as to instructors. So for sound effects, you've got it. F2 versus E skip versus uh, D uh, layer absorption. It's all on audio. And all our classes have different folks with different backgrounds. So we do fast scan television uh, with the amateur television network. We got the snap kits uh, that you see to the left and we've got uh, slow scan television you got to have stuff and it's got to be live to coincide with what they're reading in the book. And let's hope for a great summer season of e-skip on the 10 meter band. And again, get those students excited about what they're going to do. And uh, that's uh, legendary Dave Bell, silent key now, but uh, he uh, certainly had fun uh, playing with the CW uh, pickles. And we give you page numbers to describe things that you might want to do, colored water and clear tubing. And we use the Forest Mims book to help illustrate it. And again, this is free of charge to those of you that are thinking of teaching a ham class. All right, you extras uh, out there in the chat room, what have we got here? It is, did you get it yet? That's it. Optical shaft encoder with a little LED that shines through. And when you turn it, it pulses. So there you go. It's been 35 years since I was at Dayton during a mini tornado. And this was the day before, 35 years ago, we had one touchdown close. It didn't hurt the Hera Arena in the background, nor the water dome. But 35 years we've been doing these instructor training classes. We call them the Ham Instructor Academy. And we'll be up at Pacificon on the West Coast in October uh, doing a class up there. So how do I how do I get this free stuff? Go to hamminstructor.com. Haminstructor.com. That's part of the W5YI.org. Haminstructor, don't forget the dot com, and become a ham radio instructor. And uh, some of the neat things you get as an instructor through the W5YI, Haminstructor.com. Get the uh, ICOM uh, band charts. Uh, thanks, Ray. 
He always gets us squared away there. We've got our own uh, frequency charts that are available to instructors. Uh, instructors get graduation certificates, and these are free uh, if you're uh, teaching a class. Of course, the instructor patch. Um, uh, other uh, materials from uh, different manufacturers, including ICOM, Kenwood, Yezu, Alinko, and most important, the big instructor guides. And the instructor guide you'll download, it's in color, and uh, you'll get all the information on how to get started teaching a ham class or at least getting started. Plus your class is registered on the W5YI site. So neat stuff for instructors. That was our most popular demo at Dayton this uh, Xenia this past uh, couple of weeks ago. A lot of folks coming up saying we want to start teaching ham radio. You got a book about that. Yeah, we do. Thanks to the W5YI group that's uh, made all of this available, as well as George that talks about our books. We so much appreciate the YI donation to George for his prizes. And above all, thank you for helping the ham radio service grow as an instructor. Go to www.haminstructor.com. Dot com. All right, Don, what's going on with you in the down south? Well, I can tell you for uh, for a fact that Gordon's program works. I used his instructor materials, including the student quizzes and the PowerPoint and the book to uh, to teach Tyler. We did ham radio school on the kitchen table over the course of about two weeks, like every other night. Uh, we uh, had him do we do three or four chapters at a time so he didn't get didn't get burned out. And he passed on the first try. So uh, the Gordon West instructor stuff works. I highly recommend that. You got to go get it. We're going to tell you all about the news of the week. We're going to have Dr. T's solar update. And we're going to show you some video of aerial footage of Hera after the tornado. It is amazing stuff. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about DX Engineering. DX Engineering is bringing us this episode of Ham Nation. And, uh, you know, Field Day 2019, right around the corner, June 22nd, 23rd. It's only three weeks away. Still plenty of time, though, to upgrade your stations and outfit your club with official gear so you can operate in comfort and style. Comfort's what it's all about. Style, well, you're going to get that when you get DX Engineering stuff for sure. DX Engineering makes it fast and simple to get everything you need for Field Day in one convenient spot. If you're in charge of antenna setup, the DX Engineering Field Day Triplexer Filter Combo Package is a perfect choice for working 2015 and 10 meter bands with three different radios using a single tri band antenna. Yes, here's what you get Low Band Systems Innovative 200 Watt Triplexer, three LBS bandpass filters for 2015 and 10, and three coaxial cable jumper assemblies. Your choice RG 8X or high isolation RG 400. The triplexer combo eliminates the need and the cost for extra antennas while giving you fast setup and worry-free operation without RF interference. And if you're looking for a reliable field day tri-band Yagi, DX Engineering has a great lineup, including their world-famous Skyhawk. Also, DX Engineering carries the official AWRL Field Day 2019 merchandise, including the 100% cotton high-quality 2019 AWRL Field Day charcoal pocket T-shirts. With AWRL Field Day artwork silk screened on the front and the back, They're available for men and women in various sizes. Also, you can choose from the other AWRL Field Day gear, like pins, hats, patches, mugs, logbooks, everything they have. And while you're fighting the elements on Field Day, make sure DX Engineering is right there with you. The DX Engineering 10 foot by 10 foot canopy is sturdy, provides perfect shelter for a temporary station or shade for your guests. It sets up in minutes, no tools or loose parts. And uh, check out the DX Engineering Field Day Survival Package. That gives you the DX Engineering hat, T-shirt, umbrella, and a pen. Visit DX Engineering for everything Field Day, from coax to wire antenna kits, power supplies, ladder line, anything you need, it's right there. And DX Engineering ships faster than anybody else in the industry. Most orders placed by 10 p.m. Eastern are shipped the same day with proven products and expert advice. DX Engineering is helping you shrink the globe. Request your catalog or shop online. 24-7 at dxengineering.com slash ham nation. All right, so the tornado went through Dayton, Ohio uh, the other night, Monday night. Just absolutely incredible. I want you to see some aerial footage of the aftermath at Hera Arena. This is from a TV station in Dayton, uh, WHIO. 
and it's uh, it's pretty amazing. One thing uh, Bob pointed out as he watched this is that the area where his old booth was, where Audio Alley, uh, him and uh, and all the audio guys, it was untouched. But this is just amazing, amazing aerial drone video. Scrub forward uh, through that a little bit, uh, Vic, and then we'll get to the stills because we have stills of the inside. Uh, but look at the, this, the face of that. The whole corner of that building is gone. And uh, there's another building off to the side that is, uh, look at that. Oh, my God. I just, can you imagine if the Hamvention was still in Hera Arena and that would have come through during that weekend? You know, everybody thinks of Oklahoma and Kansas and Nebraska. But, uh, you know, before the big uh, EF5 and more a, a few years ago, Xenia, Ohio was the benchmark. So Ohio gets some nasty, nasty tornadoes. Now let's. Let's go to the stills and take a look inside Hera Arena. There it is. There's the hockey rink. I think I can see my seat where we used to sit. <laughs> yeah, just scrub through these pretty quick. Uh, and just, wow. Just amazing. Just absolutely incredible. Just incredible. All right, now we've got, to, that is the storm. That is it. 140 mile per hour winds. Go ahead and, and scrub through these about a second apiece. 140 mile an hour winds and billiard ball sized hail. These are taken around the Dayton, Ohio area of some of the damage. Just absolutely incredible. Man, we uh, we feel for, for those people. Uh, oh, my God. You know, growing up in Oklahoma, I mean, I have an affinity for these storms because I've been through several. And in fact, I used to chase them. That is it. That is right there where you see Riverside, between Dayton and Riverside, that hook. That is the classic hook echo. And the reason that the tail of that hook is so big is that is the debris ball. The radar is picking up the debris ball. And uh, they said that debris was indicated by radar 20,000 feet in the air. That is an EF3 tornado, 140-mile-an-hour winds. And the equivalency of a hurricane would be a Category 4. Just amazing. Mm -mm -mm. Wanted to bring those to you. We don't have information on that in Newsline because Newsline is uh, released on Friday. And, of course, that happened after Friday. But uh, there will be a story on Amateur Radio Newsline coming up this Friday about the storm. And since we're talking about Newsline, let's go ahead and get the news of the week from Amateur Radio Newsline. From Amateur Radio Newsline Report, number 2,169, these are the Ham Nation headlines for Wednesday, May 29th, 2019. Congratulations are in order for a trio of prominent radio amateurs. The CQ Contest Hall of Fame has inducted three new members. They're Bruce Horn, WA7BNM, Dean Straw, N6BV, and Cressamere Chris Kovarik, 9A5K, who became a silent key earlier this year. Bruce, who developed the 3830scores.com website, 3830scores.com, also developed the National Contest Journal website, now in use. Bruce is also manager of the North American QSO Party. Dean, who's an editor, writer, and ARRL staffer, developed the High Frequency Terrain Propagation Prediction Program, VOACAP, or Voice of America Coverage Analysis Program. Chris, who became a silent key in February, was past president of the Croatian Amateur Radio Association and vice chairman of the IARU Region 1's HF committees. A competitor in the World Radio Sport Team Championships, Chris developed the K-Log and DX-Log programs. The Contest Hall of Fame, created in 1986, now has 74 members. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Dave Parks, WB8ODF. Tower safety is something no ham or radio technician can take for granted. Federal workplace safety investigators and local police are looking into what led to one man's fatal fall from a radio tower in southwest Mississippi on May 16th. According to local news reports, Christopher Chase Hawkins of Caraway, Arkansas, was working with another tower technician when he apparently slipped and fell from the top of the 280-foot structure. The Lincoln County coroner told the Daily Leader newspaper that the two workers were doing regular maintenance, which involved changing out lightning rods. The coroner said that for some unknown reason, Hawkins unhooked his safety harness and slipped. He was pronounced dead at the scene. Christopher Chase Hawkins was 34 and a father of two. 
For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Christian Kudnick, K0STH. What happens when a really great antenna goes right to your head? Newsline anchor Neil Rapp, WB9VPG, has the hair-raising tail. Forget quarter-wave monopoles and half-wave dipoles. Now we have the head-turning, head-topping full wave of hair vertical. That's just what folks at Hamvention got to see this year in Xenia, Ohio. Beneath this towering installation of over-the-top scalp decor was Kristen Andrews KB3 OQV of Atwater, Ohio. Kristen was sporting her annual radio-themed coiffure, a bright blonde sculpture of hair and ham hardware that was anchored less by guy wires and more by gobs of hair gel. The 5 8 wavelength vertical, which sits on a magnetic base, actually works. With a mini antenna as her crowning glory, Kristen didn't complain once about signal loss, or for that matter, even about hair loss. She told one local newspaper she has been Hamvention's very own antenna hair girl since 2011, when the convention was still taking place in its previous location. Ah, uh, but why split hairs over the change of venue? Perhaps while there, she'd simply taken the name of Hair uh, Arena to heart. Or head. There are literally only hours remaining in the nominating period for the Newsline WA6ITF Young Ham of the Year Award. Full details and the nominating form can still be found on our website, arnewsline.org, under the YHOTY tab. Nominations close this Friday, May 31st at midnight Eastern Time. We'll present the award in August at the Huntsville Ham Fest in Alabama. And that's all from the Amateur Radio Newsline, your independent source for amateur radio news for four decades and counting at arnewsline.org. With Dave Parks, WB8ODF, Christian Kudnick, K0STH, Neil Rapp, WB9VPG, Karen Eve Murray, KD2GUT at the news desk in New York and our news team across the globe. I'm Don Wilbanks, AE5DW73. We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. Now here's a solar update from Dr. Tamitha Scove, WX6SWW. We have a mini solar storm. We're going to jump a Starlink train and two old bright regions are about to join us Earthside. What does all this mean for you? Those stories and more in the news this week. This forecast, sponsored in part by Eric Johansson. Check him out at Instagram.com slash Scoobist. Things are looking up in space weather this week. As we flip to our front side sun, you can see we have a coronal hole that's going to be rotating in through the Earth strike zone. It should be sending us some fast solar wind over the next couple days, and it could be bump us up to active conditions at high latitudes and bring us some decent aurora. But down at mid latitudes, well, not quite so much. It may only bring us some disturbances on Earth's night side, which could be an issue for you emergency communicators. But as we flip to our backside sun, that's where things begin to get interesting. Hello regions 27, 40, and 41. They have now rotated into stereo's view, as you can see, and they are still firing off solar storms. So this means they are still active on the sun's backside. And as they rotate into Earth view here around the end of this week, they could be boosting the solar flux for emergency communications and amateur radio operators. And they also could still be launching some solar storms. And that means next week, the space weather is going to get pretty interesting. Switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating the hit from some fast wind from a small coronal hole that's rotating in through the Earth strike zone, but we're expecting it to be more sporadic than anything. At high latitudes, NOAA is expecting unsettled to active conditions with up to about a 35% chance of a minor storm. Now, at mid latitudes, we're expecting more unsettled conditions, but there is a chance of active conditions right around the 31st and even a skosh of a chance of a minor storm. But this probably won't bring Aurora down to mid latitudes. It'll most likely just be disturbances on Earth's night side. So emergency communicators just know you might have some issues right around the 31st. But overall, this is pretty much a high latitude phenomenon because these storms are getting pretty weak. And then as we move into the early part of next week, things are definitely going to quiet back down. 
Switching to our solar flare and particle radiation storm outlook over the coming week, everything is still in the green when it comes to solar flares. This is because we do have a spotless sun, at least as far as Earth is concerned. And this should make GPS users very happy because we have no risk for radio blackouts right now on Earth's day side. However, this does mean that the solar flux has dropped back into the 60s. We are in poor radio propagation conditions right now on Earth's day side. However, we do have a little bit of spur erratic E, so that should be helping things, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. The good news is that as we get to the end of the week, we will start seeing the influence from the old regions 2740 and 2741 as they begin to rotate back into Earth view, and we could see the solar flux begin to rise and even pop back up into the marginal range for radio propagation. And then next week will be even better. So you amateur radio operators and emergency responders just kind of wait it out because next week definitely looks better than this week. Now also because we do have a solar minimum sun, the cosmic ray flux is penetrating more than it normally would be. So you frequent flyers, and this does include you air crew who fly over 800 hours annually and fly at high latitudes and high altitudes, you are in the marginal range for radiation dose. And this does include you prenatal passengers. So please take this into consideration in your flight plans. So the space weather this week is definitely getting interesting. We have a small pocket of fast solar wind that's going to be hitting us over the next couple days, and I wouldn't get super excited about it. It could definitely bring us some aurora at high latitudes, but you aurora photographers at mid latitudes, well, it's probably not going to give you all that much, so you might want to sit this one out. The nice thing is that we do have old region 2740 and region 2741 that are going to be rotating into Earth view starting around the beginning of next week, and they could be still firing some solar storms so we could get some activity from them. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, you guys are kind of dealing with the spotless sun and kind of the low propagation that we have right now, but you are getting a little bit of boost from sporadic E, especially if you're in the northern hemisphere. So kind of hold on to that for dear life, because again, we have those regions that are going to be rotating into Earth view starting around next week, and that could boost the solar flux up and give you some decent radio propagation again. Now, as far as you GPS users are concerned, well, you know, a quiet sun is a good sun for you all. So enjoy, because your GPS reception should look pretty good all the way around. I'm Tamitha Scove. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Dr. T. Always appreciate your solar updates. Be sure you follow her on uh, Twitter. She's an excellent follow, at Tamitha Scove. And I want to put in another plug for the Young Ham of the Year Award. Nominations close Friday, the 31st, at midnight Eastern. Just check the... Uh, Newsline email, we had uh, two nominations come in today, so I'll forward those off to the nomination committee. Make sure you get yours in before midnight Eastern on Friday, and uh, we'll do our best to honor a great young amateur radio operator at the Huntsville Ham Fest in August. It's a great ham fest, exactly three months after uh, Hamvention in Xenia, third weekend in August, Hamvention. Dot org is the uh, is the website for that. And as you see there on the YHOTY tab of uh, ARnewsline.org, that's where you'll find the nominating form and instructions. Email only to AR or to uh, Newsline at ARnewsline.org. Make sure you get that in before midnight on Friday and uh, uh, we'll uh, see you and uh, hopefully your young ham in Huntsville. Let's go over and see what Dale has got. He's got a new batch of videos and that's always a good time. Dale, how are you doing tonight? Hey, doing pretty good. I uh, hope you're getting along with that cold down there in uh, uh, Louisiana fairly well. And uh, Working on uh, it. I hope the weather stays safe for you. We're working on it. Thank you, sir. Oh, hey, good deal. Hey, well, tonight we're going to jump right in. We've got three videos. Uh, we'll uh, hold any photos we have in the queue for the next episode. Right now, we'll start with a, a tour of Hamvention. Dan in 9 LVS wrapped up his editing just before last week's Ham Nation hit the air and there wasn't room on the show. So we're going to lead this segment with that Hamvention tour. Here's Dan. Welcome to Hamvention 2019. One of the first places I stopped was the ICOM booth. I already have an IC 7300, but I wanted to see the IC 9700. I'm also looking at an IC7100 as a new mobile rig. And I just had to check out the 7610. Yezu had a pretty neat setup, but one thing I wanted to see here was the Yezu FT3DR. 
Then we went over to the Kenwood booth and took a look to see what they had. Elecraft introduced their KX4. Pretty impressive radio, as did Flex Radio. And if you need a new radio, you head over to DX Engineering with a huge supply of radios, as well as some of their specialty parts that they make right in-house. Not to be outdone, HRO had two booths at the Dayton Hamvention. And there also was r &L with some pretty good deals as well. And what would Hamvention be without MFJ? Every ham radio operator I know has got some MFJ product in their house or their car. And Martin Jew, founder of MFJ, was there as always. And if you're looking for an HF antenna that takes up a small area or for mobile use, Wolf Herbal Coils is a place to stop by. And there's also Aero Antenna. And let's not forget Radio Waves with a wide variety of antennas. And West Mountain Radio has the Rig Blaster and the Rig Runner. And like Bob Heil says, it all starts at the microphone. And he had a huge display of microphones at Hamvention. And Gordon West was there selling his study manuals and talking to folks. And the American Radio Relay League had a huge display with members of every department at the ARL headquarters in attendance. And for those of you that like boat anchors, the Collins Users Group was there to answer any questions that you might have about Collins radios. And everybody's got to stop off at Quicksilver and to pick up that connector that they might have lost or just doesn't work quite right anymore. Tower Electronics was there as well, selling connectors and antennas as well. They even have two displays, one in the main exhibit area and one in the flea market. The sign man has quite a few different signs. They'll even do personalized name badges and a lot of custom signs as well. And we can't forget Bagali, some of the best keys that were ever made. Then we have CQ Magazine, which is starting to get back on track again. And here's a nice little software, RT System Software, to make your radio program very, very easy. Right next to them was Batteries America. They even have batteries for some of the old HTs. And if you need something printed on a hat or a shirt, Gold Medal Ideas, that's the place to go. They do a lot of their own shirt ideas. And you can put your call sign on just about anything. They also had a pretty cool special event station set up right on the grounds. And if you couldn't make it to Hamvention, you could always watch online at W5KUB. And you really need to stop by the Ham Nation booth, along with Newsline, and meet all the hosts. They were right alongside the ICOM booth. And that's Hamvention 2019. Hope to see you here in 2020. From the Green County Fairgrounds in Xenia, Ohio, this is Dan, N9LVS, wishing you 73, and thank you for watching. Well, thanks, Dan. Uh, we appreciate all the videos you produce for Ham Nation, and we're uh, glad you maintain our Ham Nation wiki also. Thank you very much. Next, we'll take a ride with Andy. He's K9AWM as he participates in this year's Indiana QSO party. Here's Andy. Hey, welcome back as we uh, get ready for the Indiana QSO party on uh, a very rainy day in southwest Indiana. You can see Jerry behind me. Say hi, Jerry. Hey. That's KC9ZAR, and we'll turn the camera around, and he's going to explain this antenna. So stand by. Okay, Jerry, KC9ZAR, tell us about the antenna we're going to use today. Well, this is a Tar Heel screwdriver, and um, I picked it up at a ham fest. I did a little work on it, and we've used it a couple times. Works really, really good. And of course, the mount here in the truck, as you can see, is is an old uh, satellite dish mount, uh, the one that you throw the concrete blocks on, like on a roof or something. Okay, uh, computer's a little hard to see there, but uh, we're running the uh, N1MM uh, program just on a, a laptop. Got a Heil headset. Got the uh, Yaesu 991A. The uh, IRLP node that uh, puts us on the AR APRS map. A uh, little bitty um, a headphone uh, amplifier, so we can each have our own uh, amplified and uh, volume. And then, of course, a uh, Heil push-to-talk uh, sound uh, bar there. Uh, QRZ for the Indiana QSO party. Had a November 3 Lima station again, please. 
There we got you. Thank you very much for uh, calling us. Copy India November Delta Alpha Victor for Davies County and India November Kilo November Oscar for Knox County QSL. Uh, QSL 59 Maryland, right to Delta. All right, we've got a pipeline into Maryland tonight. Very good. Thanks for the contact tonight, and good luck in the contest. Of course, we are mobile, and we are at the Knox and Davis County line here in Indiana. And uh, we're using a Tar Heel screwdriver in the back of the pickup truck. As you can see, it's on a uh, satellite dish mount, portable mount. Uh, we just have it uh, anchored to the mount. Have a one-to-one -one ballon. And just some coax in the control line running through the back window. This is KC9ZAR, Jerry and Andy. K9AWM. Hey, welcome back. We are just about ready to uh, wrap up our activation for the 2019 Indiana QSO party. It's gotten dark since the last time that you've seen us, and uh, everything worked great. We did most of our uh, work on uh, 40 meters. 40 meters was uh, on uh, in pretty good shape, and uh, we ended up with, um, well, just rough numbers, uh, 289 QSOs and uh, 10,582 points. So not too bad for 100 watts, a Tar Heel antenna in the back of a pickup truck, and driving around, we worked uh, Davies, Knox, Green, Martin, Lawrence, and Orange Counties. Did I miss any? Um, Pike. Pike County. That was the other one. Gibson. So. And Gibson. <laughs> My brain is tired. That's why. Uh, so anyway, it was a it was a good activation. We did a lot of county lines and uh, made a lot of QSOs, and uh, so not too bad. Jerry, any final uh, thoughts before we go? Uh, this thanks a bunch, Andy, for all your help. It was a blast. I enjoyed it. Thanks for everybody that uh, gave us a call. All right, that's it. K9AWM and uh, KC9ZAR. We'll see you next year. Bye. Well, thanks, Andy. Uh, we enjoyed the ride. The uh, state QSO party is always uh, a good time and a lot of fun and a lot of good practice for uh, young operators uh, uh, while they're at it. A special thanks uh, for all of your work, Andy, uh, to edit down the length of the video uh, so we could present it to the Ham Nation audience this evening. Well, finally, we'll travel to Halifax, Nova Scotia, where John, VE1 JMB, gives us a look at the 2019 version of Smart 2019. The event was sponsored by the Westcom Amateur Radio Club. With the report, here is John.
Well, thanks, John, for capturing your local club's event and sharing it with us here on Ham Nation. That's going to wrap it up for the fifth Ham Nation video segment for 2019. Well, hopefully, we'll receive a few more great videos from you that we can feature for our audience very soon. Remember, we're dependent on you, the Ham Nation viewer, to send us your shack photos and your videos, and we'd love to showcase them for you. If you have any questions about producing a video, please give us a, an email. Send an email to hamnationvideos at twit.tv, and we'll be glad to help you. It's time now for Smoke and Solder. From his studio down in Jackson, Mississippi, here's George. George, take it away. Well, good evening, Dale. Good to see you again. And uh, some, some great videos there. I have one tonight, uh, one more from Hamvention that I want to play. Those of you who weren't there missed a good time with the Ham Nation Forum. And thanks to Tommy and 5 and and uh, and also Dan in 9LVS. They shot the whole forum there. I got it edited this week, and it's been posted now. We'll show you at the end of this um, uh, little video here where you can find that and watch the whole thing. But it's always special when you've got Gordo up in front of a group of hams doing some of his uh, great, well, I don't know what you call them, great demonstrations. There's no one who has mastered the cassette tape player like Gordo. <laughs> let's just take a let's take a look at him in action here. Gordon West, you're something special, buddy. What are you doing? Uh, who knows, Bob? And uh, wow, what a great team we have out there. Yes, you and we as a team are so happy just to work with you each and every Wednesday night. So keep up the good work. But Bob, we need to know who they are. So as if this were a pile up on 10 meters. Yeah, 10 meters was open the last few weeks. Let's hear those call signs and we'll make out only one. So here we go with the call signs. One, two, three. NV9L. Oh. oh, look at this. Man, Don. Don. Don's got it for ATV. Val has it in CW, but she said, it's what, it's upside down? It's upside down. It says the future is women. Uh, oh, wow. Well, I, Bob, we are so proud. And George, George made a find of all find, a new radio at the swap meet. Well, it wasn't really uh, too old, but um, not too new either. Uh, George, uh, we heard you on the air last night. So, uh, George, just a little bit of CW warble, but it's going to be okay. And, you know, there was worry. Um, they have a current technician class uh, proposal for getting more techs uh, with more privileges. And, uh, you know, um, years ago when techs had a uh, uh, boost in uh, what they could do on the air, everybody was worried that um, uh, those techs that were original CB radio operators might have a hard time adjusting in ham radio. And I don't think there was uh, any problem. CQ, CQ, CQ breaker, CQ, CQ breaker. CQ, CQ Breaker. This is QO India 6, Tango Uniform calling CQ Breaker. Come on back. We, we could have done well without the uh, come on uh, back, huh? Well, Bob, uh, your pine board is wonderful. It always sounds great. Uh, Val was going to construct one, but she, she was lacking a, I think it's uh, George, I think a capacitor in her power supply. Uh, we, we call those uh, key clicks, but uh, nonetheless, uh, Valerie is on the air and always uh, doing a great job. Valerie, what's your next de expedition? Uh, Jerry? <laughs> I don't know. He's going to Pitcairn, but I'm staying home. Uh, hopefully, we'll, we'll do something. I want to get on the other side of a pileup. Yeah, the other side of a pileup. Pit Karen, boy, that's going to be a great one. Well, George, uh, we did hear you on the air, and you helped out with uh, Valerie's um, uh, power supply uh, capacitor. We have a little recording of that. Oh, 
Oh, my goodness. How many have owned the Swan Transceiver? We were going to have one on Ham Nation. I like swans. <laughs> Just a little bit of drift, but you know, if you catch the drift, we have so much fun on Ham Nation, but it wouldn't be any fun, Bob, if we didn't have a team like you that tune us in or do a replay. So keep up the great work. Yes, I forgot my tie. So I will make it up next Wednesday night. Be sure and tune in or catch a rebroadcast. I will wear my tie. Yes. And yes, at 4 o'clock, you will witness no pants, but I do have uh, shorts. Yeah. Thank you all for making Ham Nation the best. Thanks to the volunteers that pull this event off every year for Hamvention. And have a great time. And I'll see you all out at the swap meet or in the booth at W5YI. 73! Thanks, Gordo. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, buddy. Always an exciting time at Hamvention <laughs> during the Ham Nation Forum there. Gordo, I've got to say, you played that thing like it was a Stradivarius. <laughs> well, that's what happens with uh, good old cassette tapes. And for those that go way back, the fun part of cassettes, <clears throat> unlike CD, is you can go back and forth in little pieces where the CD on a regular recorder, you'd have to go back to the main program. So cassettes are still alive in my shack. I, I see that, and uh, uh, fortunately, it seems like maybe you have a good supply of the belts for them, too. Someone asked <laughs> me this week if I would dub a cassette for them to digital, and I said, well, I've got a nice cassette deck, but I hadn't had it on in several years. I'm not sure that the rubber is still any good in it, so I'm going to have to pull mine out and try it out there. Uh, I'll send a link to Victor. If you'll show that, um, Victor, I don't know if you got it or not. It's... Uh, where you can watch the full-length version of the Ham Nation Forum. Well, it's not there. Uh, I'll just say, and not take trying to take any credit for it, because it was recorded by Tommy Martin in 5ZNO and Dan Van Evenhoven in 90LVS, but I needed somewhere to host it, so I just posted it to the Amateur Logic YouTube group. If you go there... Uh, go to YouTube, look for Amateur Logic, and you'll find it posted right there. It should be on the top right now. Or go back and check this episode of Ham Nation back up a little bit because it was shown right there. There it is. Uh, it'll be right at the bottom of this. And, um, yeah, a, a great forum there. Always a lot of fun. And we appreciate everyone who comes. It's a uh, very, very good forum. And uh, we thanks to the folks at DARA for giving us uh, room one, the big room there to host it in, because it's, uh, yeah, well, it's always a good crowd in there. Well, I've got a few pictures tonight of what I have been working on. Uh, I told you a while back I had taken delivery of a new-to-me uh, FM transmitter. It's actually a used one. came from one of our stations in San Antonio. And I have the joy of uh, resurrecting it and changing it from 94.1 to 107.5 megahertz. And it's not like on a ham rig where you can just turn the VFO and you're on your new frequency immediately. There's a good bit of adjustments and, um, and a lot of things that have to be uh, sort of recalculated and moved in there. So I'm in the process of doing that. Plus, it needed a good cleaning job as well. Here's a few photos I snapped when I was out there uh, yesterday. And you can see it right there. It's the uh, the big three racks there that are open. The sides are all off of it right now, so you know we can get in easily and work around. And you notice there's nothing in the bottom. I'll show you what goes down there in a minute because it had to be removed before the transmitter could be moved. It altogether was about... Uh, 1,600 pounds, but this is the front of it, and uh, just kind of looking at it, and I was in there doing some cleanup. You can see there's not a whole lot that's in these beasts. It's um, uh, relatively few parts when you think about it, but most of them are big. You can see down there in the bottom and the center that uh, 
that metal box sitting there that's gray, well, that's the filter capacitor on the plate supply. Uh, this is another photo right here, and these aren't in any particular order. This is looking down to where the plate transformer goes in the bottom of that cabinet. Uh, and you can see the cables on the right-hand side. That is the three-phase power that comes into the plate transformer. Uh, this is the center cabinet here. Now, uh, this one has some of the components for uh, the driver supply in there or the IPA supply is what, what they call it on this transmitter. And it's, it's solid state. There's also some overload relays and such in there that are used to shut down the transmitter should certain parameters get out of tolerance. Uh, this is a look from the back side here. On the right-hand side, you can see that blower motor down there in the bottom. That's a three-phase blower and a squirrel cage blower. That sent, forces the air up through the PA cavity there to cool the tube in this transmitter. It uses a 4CX15000A tube. In the center there, of course, is the, the back side of the cabinet we were just looking at uh, with the IPA uh, power transformer there in it. Uh, and this is some of what goes in the bottom of that transmitter. Those three pieces there are the power supply uh, for the screen and uh, a couple of little chokes down there. And you don't really get the idea of how big those are just looking right there. Uh, here is a, another photo across the whole back of it. You can see the rectifiers are those red things there on the left with the green boards. That's the three-phase rectifier stacks. Uh, there's another photo of the front of the transmitter. Oh, and I thought I had a photo of the plate transformer, the, the little 400-pound plate transformer, but apparently I skipped that. Anyway, this is the front of the transmitter I'm working on. This is 11 kilowatt. Continental transmitter, and it's going to be my backup. This is the main transmitter at this site right here. It looks virtually identical, and it is, except this is a 35-kilowatt transmitter. They use the same box, mostly the same parts inside of it, to go anywhere from 11 kilowatts up to this model. It's got 35. In the right-hand corner in the back, you can see the uh, plate transformer, is so big for a 35 kilowatt transmitter that has to be in a separate cabinet and it's off there to the rear and uh well here's what the plate voltage looks like on that transmitter this uh, this is a 35 kilowatt one i'm only running it at 30 kilowatts so so you can see i'm not quite at uh, 10 kilovolts of plate voltage uh plate current is a measly 3.78 amps. Uh, I'm a little concerned about my reflected power. If you, if you look here, it's um, it's up a little bit. That is, well, this is a three kilowatt slug in this meter right here. So it's almost up to 100, well, right around 130 watts of reflected power. That's, that's a lot, isn't it? Well, let's look at the forward power. Now, I don't run that transmitter at 35 kilowatts. I don't need that much power. Unfortunately, I'm down about 500 watts right here. It's only running, uh, according to the meter here, uh, 29 and a half kilowatts, not quite making the full 30. Well, 130 watts of reflected power sounds like a lot of reflected power, doesn't it? But when you calculate it out, and you're running uh, 29 and a half kilowatts, that's SWR of only 1.14 to 1, uh, which is still more than you'd want to run, but uh, this is the way I inherited this site, and I have not had any antenna issues, so I have not had anybody go up and try to retune it, and I won't until, um, until we have some kind of issues and I need to do that, because you never want to break open that pressurized transmission line if you don't have to. Uh, you might think, well, gee, 30 kilowatts on a tube-type transmitter, maybe that generates a little bit of heat. Well, uh, yeah, I've got a meat thermometer there in the exhaust stack, and we're running about 172 degrees coming out of that exhaust stack. So 
uh, that's pretty warm. You could you could dry your hair pretty quick with that, although I, I don't think I would want to. But that's what I have been up to here lately, and um, I've got a lot more to do. I've just begun cleaning it. It needs a lot of cleaning. And I'm finding, you know, some few things that are not just right in there that I'm going to take care of in the meantime. But uh, that's what I've been up to this week and likely for several more weeks in the future. Well, we'll be back in just a moment. But first, let's get a message from one of our fine sponsors, ICOM. Create your own band opening with the IC9700. ICOM's newest SDR transceiver, the IC9700, this new radio is bringing direct sampling to the UHF-VHF weak signal world. The IC9700 all-mode transceiver is loaded with innovative features, such as dedicated amateur satellite operation, color touchscreen, built-in D-Star capability, RF direct sampling on 2 meters and 70 centimeter bands, dual independent receivers capable of full duplex operation as well as dual watch, 100 watts maximum output power on 2 meters, 75 watts max on 70 centimeters, and 10 watts max on 1.2 gigahertz. Visit icomamerica.com slash amateur for more information on all the great ICOM radios. Attention all hams! ICOM knows that ham clubs play a big role in bringing ham communities together to learn from their peers and industry leaders. As a way to give back and help you on your mission, ICOM has launched a promotion exclusively for U.S. ham clubs and the ham fest they're involved with. By registering your club, you could win ICOM swag, a Skype presentation for your club, or your ham fest an ICOM booth set up. Register today for your chance to win at icomamerica.com slash hams. And ICOM invites you to enter in the weekly drawing for some great swag prizes like T-shirts and hats. And you could also be registered to possibly win the monthly grand prize drawing for a new radio. For May, it's the ID4100A entry-level D-Star Mobile with big rig features. It's VHF and UHF dual-band transceiver, one band at a time. It's got advanced D-Star features built-in GPS, micro SD card slot for voice and data storage, and there's an Android and iOS app available. You need to go to icomamerica.com slash hamnation after this and each episode and register to win because somebody's going to win it. Hey, it might as well be you. icomamerica.com slash hamnation. Uh, sign up. Good luck. And don't forget to follow Icom America Inc., on Facebook and Twitter. And now the queen of the chat room, it's Amanda. Well, good evening, George, and thank you so much. I, I thoroughly enjoyed your video, and so did Delta, evidently, because she wants to speak about it. Uh, sorry about that. All right. Uh, the first question is actually for you, George. Uh, W1MWB Mike wants to know, is that transmitter set up? available so that you can dial in from it away from the station and check power and SWR meters? Uh, yeah, you, you can check the power, the uh, forward power, reflected power, the plate current, plate voltage, and uh, a few other things, temperature in the room, um, all remotely. It's just with a dial-up phone. And fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, it will also call me and wake me up at 3 o'clock in the morning if there's an issue. So <laughs> it goes both ways. So then can you also reboot it remotely? Uh, you can turn it on and off. Yeah, that's would be like – it's not like killing the breaker, but, yeah, <laughs> you turn off the plate voltage. You let it cool down uh, a minute or two, and then you can turn off the filaments. Or you can turn on the auxiliary transmitter from there and put it on if you need to. So, yeah, there's there's several things you can, can do remotely. You use a separate piece of gear to do that. Uh, some of the newer transmitters, that's built in it. But at this site, it was in the rack of gear there that was in the first photo I showed tonight as a, a dial-up remote control. Very cool. That kind of saves you some time. All right, uh, oh, yeah. Gordo, this next question is for you. You had mentioned about making sure that your your 
your VE sessions were accessible to everybody and to be safe. And I was just curious, I think I've asked this before and it was a long time ago, but do you make it so that um, anyone with disabilities can go in there and test such as um, a blind person or anything like that, you guys? Uh, and is that required throughout the United um, States to be able to do that? Um, yes, uh, the American Disabilities Act, uh, the W5YI group, uh, one of the uh, uh, friendliest uh, volunteer examination uh, groups around the country, all of their members fully understand that we make every exam accessible for anyone with any type of disability. Uh, many times we ask to know ahead of time because we'll need a second room if we're going to read an examination to someone that is visually impaired. And um, we um, uh, have a group of volunteer examiners. They bring in their own exams. We have no idea what they are. And um, uh, it's, uh, it's just great to see the extra time through the W5YIVE see that they'll spend with an applicant that may have a disability by the time they get through with the exam there's no more disability that's going to hinder them getting on the air and contributing to our great ham radio hobby that's absolutely right and uh, thank you gordo for working so hard for that and i think um a lot of people are grateful uh, and the other thing is, is that they don't only read to people that might be uh, visually impaired, but they read to children who can't actually read some of the words on the test. So that's kind of cool, too. Right, Gordo? Uh, precisely. In fact, uh, Dave and Tina, uh, they many times will work with uh, young kids and they're so friendly. It's almost like a casual exam, but they will, if the student is prepared, Fry out of them uh, the correct answer and uh, get it down on uh, the answer sheet. So um, we uh, we really enjoy uh, the volunteer examiners, league examiners, um, all of the other examiners. We're all in this together, and it's our future of ham radio growing by getting more kids uh, less frightened when they come to take the test. <laughs> Very good. And Brett, to answer your question there in the chat room, yes, it's totally legal to transmit with a dog barking in the background. I promise you, I've heard it several times, not only in my own household. Hi, hi. Uh, okay. I did have another question for you, Gordo. Uh, KB7YVV, he wants to know, what is the best equipment for APRS on a train? Uh, APRS on, did you say a train? Yes, yes, like an Amtrak. Okay. Um, well, hopefully uh, the windows are not uh, tinted with a metallic surface, and you'll need to get the uh, HT that may have uh, the built-in uh, GPS right next to and looking out at the sky, and the antenna also looking out at the sky. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to access a digipeter that will uh, tie a GPS signal into the Internet, um, if not, uh, you'll be squawking at least locally, but uh, uh, there's almost no way to get an outside antenna. So just hold it close to the window and let's hope that the window does not have a metallic coating on it. Or you can just stick your head out every time those silly trains take a break because they <laughs> stop so often to let everybody out. It drives me nuts. I've been on <laughs> I've been on a train one time in my life, and I thought it was way too many stops. So just hop out there then and put out your put out your APRS stuff and uh, get a beacon. But you know, don't don't trust it for Echo Link or anything. Um, there you go, now, Amanda. Oh, I do have one question, and this will be yeah. for the chat room and for George. When you're cooling a big tube, do you pull air off of the tube and out? Or do you take air and push it onto the tube and down? So that's my big question for next week. And maybe you or George can answer it. Which way do you pull or push air through a high-powered tube? Huh. Interesting question. You know, I think about my amplifier and I, I see where the vent holes are. So, hmm might just be from the side. Uh, a big announcement here in this household 
Jeff and I are getting a new HF rig and it's coming tomorrow. Whoa. And I, I cannot wait to show everybody what it is. Uh, I'm so excited. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I really am. I am truly excited. Uh, we can't wait. So uh, with that, I'm going to go over some nets tonight. The 40 meter net is kind of iffy. Kevin said, uh, KC7 FPF, he said, Conditions are pretty rough, so look around 7192. If you don't hear anything, then maybe there's not going to be a net tonight. On 20 meters, we're going to be on 14268. On D Star, we're going to be on 14 Charlie, and on DMR, we're going to be on TAC 311. So look around, everybody. Join in on those nets where you can, and thank you again to all of our net controls. You guys are awesome. So with that, uh, Georgie, are you wrapping this up? I can put the wraps on it, Amanda. Good okay. to see you back again tonight. And everyone else, uh, a fun show. Uh, we've got our fingers crossed for Bob and everyone in the path of the storm there. I um, hope you all all are safe tonight. And, boy, uh, a really rough time up there. But um, it'll be over before you know it. And, uh, you know, our thoughts and prayers go out to those up in the Dayton area who were affected with the storms that came through there recently and everyone else in the path. We've got all summer to look forward to more of this coming. So uh, everyone be safe and get some kind of plan in order when it hits your area, if you're in that part of the country, which seems like that area is uh, larger now than, than maybe it used to be. Well, thanks again, everyone, for being here. Before we leave, let's make a, a quick round and see if everyone's got any final parting thoughts. Uh, Gordo, master of the cassette recorder, any any final thoughts from you tonight? Uh, no, we're good, and I'll take a look through my rubber belt connection box and see if you need a replacement. I may have it. <laughs> Okay, good deal, because they're getting hard to find now. Uh, Dale, Master of the Viewer Videos, any any final words from you? I, I hope you're enjoying good weather over there right now. Uh, we have had today outstanding weather. A little, little cloudy in the afternoon, but the temperature's just right, and uh, everything's good. Cause we've had about uh, two and a half weeks of uh, these storms coming through uh, either one side of the state or the other, so I just... It's been something else. But, yeah, it's nice today. It's supposed to be nice uh, tomorrow and Friday, and uh, then it uh, may start up again. So uh, everybody stay safe out there. Uh, do send in your shack photos and do send in your videos uh, for uh, display here on Ham Nation. We'll be glad to get them on the air for you. That's about it, George. Good night to all. Okay. Uh, and Amanda? Uh, always good to have you back, and I'm interested to see what you and Jeff have got coming there in the HF rig department. I I can only speculate. I've got an idea of uh, what I would be getting, so we'll look forward to hearing from you next week and 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 see how you made out. Well, I am excited to show everybody too. And by the way, I want to be the number one on the list of Bob and Gordo coming out and installing a phase array antenna for me. So <laughs> I'm on the list first. <laughs> hi, hi. Uh, yeah, that's that was pretty cool. And I have some questions for Bob about that next week. We'll talk about it later. Yeah, I saw some of those in there. I know the answers to some of them because I run a phased array too, but it's on medium wave. So it's, you know, similar exact same theory just a little bit different and i got a new radio too when i was at dayton i got this right here and i'm not going to talk about it yet because i haven't done anything with it uh, i haven't had a chance to install the software or do anything yet but i'm looking forward to to playing with this right here it's not going to replace my hf rig of course but well, this is going to be a nice compliment to the shack, I think. Well, thanks for being here once again, everyone, tonight. Um, and join us back again next Wednesday night at the same time. And uh, we'll have another great show for you. 7-3. Seven, 7-3. Three. Seven, three. Seven, three.